Face here back with another reaction video. This time I'm reacting to the Nuremberg trial by History Scope. Now I'm not too familiar with the channel History Scope, so I don't know how good they are, so I don't know it's not up to me to recommend it, but this is um this is a, a request one of two and um I thought it'd be a good and I thought it'd be a good chance to react to some something different, like you know um, a different something from a different um, history channel that I'm not too familiar with and then hopefully my reaction will bring more publicity to their channel and um, but that's well, but um, I'm a little bit f I'm a little bit familiar with the Nuremberg trial because um, for those who don't know which was at the end of the Second World War was um, was a was a was a, um, basically a a huge uh, basically a trial of all the Nazi war criminals after World War Two. just to make a long story short so um, <coughs> so um anyway the usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical if I don't show so much what is considered a proper reaction is probably obvious I don't know much about the subject at hand and if I do know anything I most likely will pause the video to give my input or ask any curious questions which hopefully will be answered in the comments below so, with that being said, the link to the original video will be in the description down below. Please go and subscribe to History Scope, check out their channel, and um, support their content. And, um, yeah, just basically, long story short, just give them all the support you can. So, um, so now that I've said all that, let's not waste any more time. Let's get this up on the screen and let's see what happened. See what we can le more, learn more about the Nuremberg trial. The Nuremberg Trials saw the end of a regime that mm. caused the Holocaust, and it was yeah. the first time in history where an international so court right. sentenced people to prison and to death. Sorry, I missed that. I'm in history. Nuremberg Trials saw the end of a regime that caused the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and it was the first time in history where an international court sentenced people to prison and to death. It would later set the stage for an international court of justice, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh -huh. and two Geneva Conventions. Mm. Germany started the Second World War when it invaded Poland, and eventually yep. attacked over half a dozen countries throughout the continent. But by 1943, the tide of war had turned. Which is uh, contrary to the First World War, because Germany did not did not start the First World War, which um which I only learned in the past five years that it wasn't actually Germany who started the First World War it was the Austrian Hungarian the Austria-Hungarian Empire when it attacked uh, sent an impossible list of demands to Serbia which they accepted all but one and that gave them an excuse to invade and shall try and take out Serbia but but I've already got videos that I've reacted to by Epic History TV about the First World War, so feel free to check them out. They're on my channel. Soviet Union was mm. beginning to push back at Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad. While the British, meanwhile, had beaten back the German air raids and pushed the Axis powers out of Africa. Mm. So the leaders of the major Allied powers came together to discuss the state of the world after World War II had ended. Stalin of the Soviet Union, Roosevelt of the USA, and Churchill of the United Kingdom discussed. Yeah, this was an alliance where, where I think a lot of people in in the UK and the US would say, kind of making a deal with the devil, because like, I mean, America was in a decent position because, you know. Britain and other European powers were buying stuff from the Americans from the First World War, but the thing is, at the start of the Second World War, Britain's econom economy was horrendous, especially with the, uh, especially with um, especially even during the air raids, the economy was struggling like mad after after the first world war and uh 
and uh, a lot of um, the other European, European nations were, economies were struggling I think to an extent the American economy at the time was struggling but it was probably in a better position than most because um, of all the materials and arm uh, weaponry that was being bought from the Americans and uh, of course Russia or the USSR had its own problems especially with um, the way Stalin ruled over the USSR but, but as I say I think but again I'll just say this is kind of making a deal with the devil so to speak because that was the only other nation that if I remember rightly had more resources because one of the best decisions that the USSR did was um, move most of the industry east during the Nazi invasion so and also they had the numbers so but as I said I could feel free if I've missed out anything but I'll probably miss out quite a lot so that's creating the United Nations the D-Day mm. invasions and dividing Germany up into four occupation zones mm. Because Germany will be divided. Wow. But that was not all. Over the course of World War II, it became apparent that Germany committed atrocities on a massive scale. Mm -hmm. The night raids, the forced deportations, the mass genocide. Yeah. There was only one question on everybody's mind. How do you punish acts that are this evil? To this question, there were basically only three answers. The first was to do nothing. To let all the atrocities, all the death, all the destruction go unpunished. But how could any country consent to such mm. a course of action? How could the far off USA, the invaded Soviet Union, or the occupied Czechoslovakia consent to such a course of action? The second option was to put all the perpetrators to death. And yes, I, I know the, U, the USSR committed atrocities on their own, but that's that's another subject completely so through executive action mm. to simply give the command to kill thousands of people regardless of whether they committed any war crimes or not but this action was disliked by both Roosevelt and Churchill at the time and so eventually by the end of the war a third option was chosen justice through persecution it was decided that the perpetrators of the Second World War and of the Holocaust would be dealt a fairness and justice mm -hmm. that they themselves destroyed in Germany. But that brought up the next question. How do you punish someone from another sovereign country for crimes that are not actually illegal in that country? The Allied powers answered this question with the London Charter of the International Military Tribunal. This charter laid out a system where four different legal codes of France, the Soviet Union, the United States and the United Kingdom would be incorporated into a single tribunal. There were prosecutors and defense attorneys according to British and US laws, but decisions and sentences were imposed by a group of judges according to French and Soviet legislation. Furthermore, four types of crimes were determined that a person could be indicted for. The first is crimes against peace, which included planning, initiating, and waging wars of aggression, or mm. wars... Well, which mostly was down to Hitler and the Nazis' uh, hatred for Jews, basically. Because they... Because um, apart from the obvious that the, um, the war guilt clause from the First World War was a deep resentment in Germany, and uh, of course... Hitler, who was technically Austrian, he was um he was a he was probably like one of the big he was also a soldier in the First World War who was lucky not to get shot and um but used used this as part of his um way to win power over the people because it's not really fully known like why he had hatred of Jews but it could be down partly down to his you know Christian faith so um but as I said I'm not going to ramble on too long about this so in violation of international treaties mm -hmm. the second is crimes against humanity such yeah. as extermination deportation and genocide the third is war crimes 
This basically meant a violation of the rules of war that were set before the Second World War, such as executing prisoners. The fourth crime is a common plan or conspiracy to commit any of the three aforementioned crimes. After all, simply because you didn't put anyone in the gas chambers yourself doesn't mean you're not guilty of creating the system mm -hmm. leading to such genocide. It would be possible for someone to be indicted for any or all of these crimes. For example, Wilhelm Keitel, who was the de facto head of the German military during the war, was indicted for all four crimes. He was found guilty on all four charges at the Nuremberg trial and sentenced to death. Or take the case of Julius Streicher, publisher of an anti-Semitic newspaper. He was only indicted for conspiracy and crimes against humanity, and he would only be found guilty of the latter, although he too would be sentenced to death for that crime. It is important to note that this is not the only trial. There were several others, such as the doctor's trial and the judge's trial. The Nuremberg trial, however, was only for the worst offenders. Those who had created the system of oppression and extermination in Germany and its occupying territories. One of such worst offenders is Wilhelm Frick, Minister of the Interior and co-author of anti-Semitic laws imposed in Germany before the war. Or Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the highest ranking SS officer tried at Nuremberg and chief of the intelligence Gestapo. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, the SS or the Gestapo, as they were known, were were the he, the narrator will probably get into this. Say that there was basically there they were Nazi Germany's intelligence agency and and secret police. So basically, the SS means secret service, which prob you probably already figured out. But um, yeah, they gained too much power. And especially from their commander Heinrich Himmler, who was probably worse, probably just as bad, if not worse, than Hitler himself. So it's um they gained way too much power and influence within the Nazi regime, and even. That even caused divisions between the SS and the actual German Wehrmacht or army, should I say, armed forces. Sorry, there's probably I should have said armed forces at the beginning. So, but anyway, Apo and criminal police. Mm -hmm. Both of them would be found guilty, and both of them would be sentenced to death. In total, twenty-four men would be indicted at the trial. Of these twenty-four. There are three special cases we need to discuss first. First is Martin Bormann, who was party secretary. He was absent at the trial. He would be found guilty and sentenced to death in absentia. However, it would be discovered in 1972 that he had actually died a few days before the war had ended, but his body wasn't identified before then. There's also the case of Gustav Krupp von Bohlen und Halbach, a major industrialist. He was found medically unfit for trial and passed away in 1950 without sentencing. And thirdly is the case of Robert Ley, head of the German trade unions. He believed that, as the loser in the war, he ought to just be shot rather than to be brought before a tribunal like a criminal. Ley therefore strangled himself in his cell three days after receiving his indictment. The trial was now almost ready to begin. The war was over, the men had been captured and the crimes were determined. But there was one well there is the point where um which i found out recently like well recently i'd say four or five years ago that um thanks to the program that i was watching on one of the freeview channel um documentary channels on my on my freeview here um it's called hunting hitler and they found out a number of officials were hiding out in different parts some so a lot of it, a lot of them in South America, and and a possible place where where like they found out that um, the so-called bod body of Hitler that was found that was found after World War Two had ended turned out to be a decoy, and it could be a possibility that Hitler and a lot of um, high-ranking Nazi officials would have been hiding out in South America which they found evidence for like secret secret like 
camps, towns, structures. But anyway, but but as it's explained, it's like this is for like most of the Nazi war criminals in in the Nuremberg trial. So. One more obstacle to overcome before the trial could commence, and that was the problem of language. This trial was held between French, English, Russian and German speakers. How were they going to communicate efficiently with each other? IBM came up with a brilliant system that we still use today, simultaneous interpretation. This is the technique where interpreters translate what is being said while it is being said and then everybody can listen to the translation in their own native language directly via headphones. This is how, for example, the United Nations and the European Parliament work yeah. today. Yeah. Now it was time for the trial to commence. Each of the four countries provided a prosecutor and a team of experts behind them. Mm -hmm. The defendants were entitled to receive a copy of the indictment made against them, any relevant explanation about the indictments, and to be represented by a lawyer of their choice. And of course, the defendants chose the best German lawyers they could possibly find. To give an example of how good these lawyers are, let's look at the case of Admiral Karl Dönitz, head of the German Navy from 1943 onward. He was indicted because he had ordered his submarines not to help the survivors of any sinking ship, instead letting them drown in the Atlantic Ocean. This was in clear violation of the Second London Naval Treaty. His lawyer, however, would save his life. He presented evidence that the USA had committed the exact same breach of the treaty in the Pacific in its war with Japan, and argued that Dönitz should not be convicted for a crime the USA also committed. And it worked. Karl Dönitz was sentenced to only 10 years in prison. He was released in 1956 and died in 1980. When the trial first started, prosecution was afraid there wouldn't be any evidence that these men were responsible for the atrocities committed during the war. But they forgot the German character. The Germans documented everything. 47 crates of binders, wow. 1400 kilograms of party records, and kilometers of film poured in. Therefore, the prosecution decided not to go directly after the greater atrocities of World War II. Instead, they wanted to lay bare the system of conspiracy that would slowly lead to the Second World War and the atrocities mm -hmm. committed in them. They wanted to prove that it was these men who created the system that would lead to these atrocities. From the supposed need for breathing room to feed the German people, to the aspiration of the extermination of what they considered an undesirable population. Mm. The prosecution pulled out one incriminating... Which, which long story short means Jews, people of colour and disabled and handicapped of every category basically. Because the because according to the Nazi regime, they they had to be like the perfect nation, or Aryan, if you if you will. Document after another, such as a document that showed how they were planning to start a war by whatever means necessary. Mm -hmm. It is my unalterable decision to squash Czechoslovakia by military means in the near future. It is the job of the political leaders to bring about the military and politically suitable moment. The primary defense of these actions was that they were only made illegal after the crimes had been committed. But the prosecution countered by stating that the first person to be sentenced for murder could just as easily have argued that nobody had ever been sentenced for murder, so why should they? They argued that some crimes are so universally immoral that it shouldn't require a precedent. Mm. One of the defendants, Albert Speer, realized that the prosecution, the Allied powers, and the judges wanted to hear an apology, an admission of wrongdoing, an expression of repentance, and so he simply gave them one. He took personal responsibility for the crimes he and his country had committed. While Speer was responsible for ordering the use of hundreds of thousands of slave laborers, he himself was only sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was released in 1966 and died in 1981. Now that the prosecution had presented that there was indeed a common conspiracy against peace and certain types of people, 
They continued with the greater atrocities of the war. They showed a documentary about the concentration camps, which I will not show here because I do not want any of my audience to involuntarily see the horrific acts depicted in them. If you do want to see the evidence, it is available on the English Wikipedia page on the Nuremberg Trials, and I will leave a link in the description. This film showed the horrors of the concentration camps, the piles of bodies, the gas chambers, the unimaginable suffering. People in the courtroom cried, some even fainted. The defense of these men on trial could largely be summed up as, I was just following orders. The prosecution deconstructed that argument stating that men who commit crimes cannot plea as a defense that they committed them in uniform. Military men are not above and beyond the moral requirements that apply to others, incapable of exercising moral judgment on their own. They pointed out that another German general, Evan- That's because they were brainwashed, especially the, the Nazi youth were the worst. Ben Rommel had been ordered to kill any commandos that he had or would capture. But Rommel had burned the order, showing that even a high-ranking general was able to exercise moral judgment and disobey immoral orders. As the trial progressed, a very curious case became clear, that of Hjalmar Schacht. Schacht was a prominent banker and economist in Germany, having served as president of the central bank and economics minister. While an important figure before the war, he had lost all his power by the time it started, and had even been in contact with resistance leaders until he himself was put in a concentration camp. In the end, he was acquitted and set free, and would go on advising developing countries on matters of finance and economics, and passed away in 1970. By now, all the evidence had been presented, and the accused had been given the opportunity to defend themselves. It was now time to pass judgment. It took the judges two days to determine the sentences of these 24 men. 12 were sentenced to death by hanging, 7 were sent to prison, 3 were acquitted, and 2 were left without a decision. Of those men sentenced to death who have not yet been named in this video are Hans Frank, Governor General of Occupied Poland. Alfred Jodl, a general in the German military who signed the summary execution of the Allied commandos and Soviet commissars. Joachim von Ribbentrop, Ambassador to the UK and later Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was responsible for a treaty that divided Poland up between Germany and the Soviet Union. Alfred Rosenberg, Minister of Eastern Occupied Territories. Fritz Sauko head of the slave labor program. Arthur Sees Inquart, commander of the occupied Netherlands. And Hermann Göring, we'll come back to him in a little bit. The men sentenced to prison who have not yet been named. Walter Funk, minister of economics and sentenced to life imprisonment, but released due to ill health in 1957 and passed away in 1960. Konstantin von Neurat, minister of foreign affairs and Reich protector of Bohemia and Morovia and resigned in 1943, sentenced to 15 years in prison, but released in 1954 due to ill health, and passed away in 1956. Erich Reder, commander-in-chief of the German Navy until his retirement in 1943, sentenced to life imprisonment, but released in 1955 due to ill health, and passed away in 1960. Baldur von Schirach, head of the party's youth division until 1940, sentenced to 20 years in prison and passed away in 1974. And Rudolf Hess, we'll also get back to him later. Out of the three men who were acquitted, there was the previously named Schacht, but also Hans Fritze, a popular radio commentator and head of the news division of the propaganda ministry. His crimes were not deemed severe enough for this tribunal, and he would later be sentenced to nine years in prison at a different trial. He would be released in 1950 due to ill health and died in 1953. And there is Franz von Papen. He served as the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor of Germany, was an ambassador to Austria and later Turkey. He was acquitted at Nuremberg. However, he would later be sentenced to eight years in prison for his actions during the war. He appealed that decision and was once again acquitted after serving only two years in prison and passed away in 1969. The hangings of those sentenced to death would take place two weeks later. Hermann Göring, the highest ranking man on trial, took one last act of defiance by committing suicide. 
He was commander of the Air Force, de facto head of the economy, and the original head of the Gestapo. He was found guilty on all charges and sentenced to death. The hangings were supposed to be done via the standard drop method, where the goal is to break the neck so the person dies instantly instead of suffering a slow strangulation. But some of the hangings were botched and took several minutes of strangulation before they died. Von Ribbentrop took 17 minutes to die. Jodl, 18, and Keidel, 28. The bodies were then cremated and the ashes dumped into the river. The last one of these men to die was Rudolf Hess. He flew to Scotland in 1941 to negotiate a peace treaty with the British, but was instead imprisoned. Thus, he didn't participate in many of the atrocities. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and died in 1987 when he strangled himself at the age of 93. The prison was demolished to prevent it from becoming a shrine to followers of that toxic ideology. But instead, his burial site became a destination for yearly pilgrimages by neo-Nazis. So when the lease on his burial site ended in 2011, his grave was reopened, his remains cremated, and his ashes scattered at the sea. And so ended the regime that started the Second World War in Europe, committed genocide with a brutality rarely seen in history, and took the lives of 50 to 56 million people. This video was only a summary of the Nuremberg Trials. Yeah. I had to leave out many things, such as the fact that the Soviet Union committed many of the same atrocities mm -hmm. but were not put on trial, or why Nuremberg was chosen as the location. Therefore, if you're interested in reading more about the topic, I will provide a few sources down below where you can learn more about the subject. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and press the, the subscribe one I'll react button. To. My next video will finish the series on the Tulip Mania, and after that I will start a new series on the Aztec Empire. If you want to see those and other videos as soon as they come out, press the subscribe button. And that'll do it. This has been an interesting video and um, a good video done by History Scope. And um, as the narrator said, he had to leave out quite a lot, but, it's, but it still showed a lot of information about the Nuremberg Trials and the war crimes committed by the German Nazi regime and um, and uh, basically there's not much I can add to that really but <clears throat> so this is like sort of like I wouldn't say like the beginning because I'm but I'd say this is like a major this was a major step forward in like an international tribunal for war crimes because I believe the Geneva Convention was uh, was invented before World War One, if I remember rightly. But feel free to correct me if I'm wrong about that in the comments below. So, um, so anyway, if you like this reaction, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video.